Thank you, Jim. Well, all right. It's Bible prophecy time. <laughs> I've really been looking forward to the resuming of our prophecy updates after having been on my uh, yearly staycation for the last couple of weeks. I can't really take more than two weeks off because then I start having uh, similar symptoms to that which uh, some of you have shared with me that you've been having, uh, namely withdrawals. Uh, there were so many times that I was yelling at my TV whenever there was breaking news, thinking, oh man, we gotta... And I realized, well, I have to wait for a couple of weeks. So, <laughs> in retrospect, I don't think I could have ever chosen a worse time uh, to be gone with all that happened prophetically on the geopolitical landscape just in the last two weeks. I'm thinking I would have been in trouble had the rapture happened in my absence because uh, some of you might have, you know, gotten upset with me. Of course, then once we were caught up in the air, I don't think it would have been a problem. Uh, but I, I got a kick out of this one Facebook friend uh, comment. Uh, she posted, I cannot wait for him to get back. OMG. Uh, World War III is about to start. The rapture is about to take place. And he picks now to take a vacation? We miss you, JD. Come back soon or see you in the air. Well, we preferred the latter, naturally. But uh, we're still here. And for a lo how long, we don't know. We don't know because we can't know. Uh, we can't know because no one knows the day or the hour. It will come as a thief in the night, as an hour in an hour that we expect not. Uh, so how's about we just continue to stay on message and occupy until he comes and preach the gospel and reach the lost? And I believe that like never before in human history, the time is now to snatch as many people out of the fires of hell while there's still time. I believe that day is coming soon and very soon when it's going to be too late. Uh, I think it's sooner than any of us really know. It could happen at any time. The rapture of the church of Jesus Christ is imminent in that it can happen in any minute, in any second. If you were to ask me what one of the main reasons is that we started doing these weekly prophecy updates, which it's been six years now, the Lord really had spoken to my heart uh, back in 2006 and made it very clear to me uh, that I was to begin doing these prophecy updates on a weekly basis because of the lateness of the hour in which we live, if you were to ask me why, this would have to be it. It would have to be because, simply put, it's to know Him and make Him known in this last hour as our redemption draweth nigh, seeing all these things begin to come to pass, like Jesus said in Luke 21, 28, these things are beginning to come to pass. You know, my hope has always been and is still that these prophecy updates would reach not only our Jerusalem, which we see as the island of Oahu, but also our Judea, which we see as the outer islands, and Samaria, which we see as the mainland, and then the uttermost parts of the earth, which is the rest of the world. And thanks to technology, it seems that God, in spite of us, has deemed it fit to use this small, obscure church here in Kaneohe to do just that. And he's done it in such a fashion that there's no way, even if we wanted to, that we could take the credit for it. He gets all the glory. And in so doing, he has taken the credit for it in that which he has done, he is doing, and is yet to do. I happen to believe that God is not through yet and has a plan for us as a church body. 
And I'm excited to see what it is that God's going to do in the remaining time that we have as we seize every opportunity that he presents to us to make him known. I hope that these prophecy updates become for you an opportunity to give to every man an answer of that hope that lies within you because make no mistake about it, people are very fearful when they see what's happening in the world, when they see what's happening here in the United States at home, it's very fearful. And we have the answer, we have the hope, we have that blessed assurance. For today's update, and because so much has happened uh, in my absence from the pulpit, I'm going to need about three hours. It's, uh... <laughs> Some of you are saying, yes, amen. <laughs> Not so fast. <laughs> Actually, maybe surprisingly, we won't take as long as I know some of you would want me to take uh, this because many of you are already prophecy savvy. I don't say that in the, you know, from a standpoint of pride, but uh, you know that which is coming to pass will come to pass, and when it does come to pass, it doesn't shake you. It doesn't move you. Uh, what I mean by that is when the Muslim Brotherhood's Mohammed Mursi won the presidency in Egyptians' elections, all of you knew right where to go in the Word of God, Isaiah 19. Why? Because you understand that this prophecy is now being fulfilled in real time concerning Egypt. Uh, when the situation in Bashar al-Assad's Syria went from bad to worse and from Holmes to Damascus, all of you knew that it wasn't Isaiah 19, but rather Isaiah 17. You're all too familiar with that prophecy, which again is happening now. And when the news broke that Mahmoud Ahmadinejad's nuclear Iran now has the capability of launching a missile that will reach Israel, <laughs> you all know that it's the beginning of the fulfillment of Ezekiel's prophecy in chapters 38 and 39. And when Iran satanically states, and it is satanic, that Israel must vanish from the world, not only do you think of Ezekiel 38, you think of Psalms 83 by virtue of how it's very likely that that prophecy in Psalms 83 will be fulfilled prior because of those nations and people groups that are listed in that prophecy. Uh, if you'll indulge me for just a brief moment, I want to give you a smattering of recent headlines, most of which you're already probably aware of and even privy to, but there's something in them and about them that the Lord has impressed upon my heart, and I want to uh, share that with you. Uh, let me just quickly read these headlines. The first one is, Top Iran Official, Time Has Come for Israel, U.S., to Vanish from World. Uh, this should, again, not come as any surprise, because in Islam, Israel is the little Satan, and the United States of America is the great Satan. Did you realize that? You're the great Satan. Hope you had a great Fourth of July here in the United States of America. We're the great Satan, according to Islam. Here's another one. Iran will destroy 35 U.S. bases if attacked. I wonder if any of those 35 are here on the islands. Iranians help Hezbollah build tunnels in Lebanon. Iran test fires missiles able to hit Israel. Iran, Hezbollah to defend Syria from attack. Wow, shocking, huh? Wipe them off the face of the earth. Iran issues new threat to Israel. And whenever I read a headline like that, I, I kind of wonder, do they open up their Bibles to Psalms 83 
I mean, because it's almost verbatim <laughs> what we read in that prophecy, in that psalm. Syria helicopters strike Damascus suburb, diplomacy stalled. Turkey scrambles jets as Syria aircraft near border. Russian military to hold over 1,000 drills in June through October. Iran, there will be war and we will win. This uh, brings to mind the prophecy from Jesus himself in Matthew's Gospel, the 24th chapter, known as the Olivet Discourse, when he says that there will be wars and rumors of wars, maybe better understood threats of war. Even now we see this beginning to come to pass. Egypt's new leader vows support for Palestinians. Putin, Russia already recognizes Palestine. Assad says Syria at war as battle reaches capital, speaking of Damascus. Syria's chemical weapons, wait, what? Syria's chemical, Syria has chemical weapons? Yeah, how secure are they from jihadists? That's the headline. Where did Syria get chemical weapons? Oh, from one Saddam Hussein and from Iraq. And that's why everybody in the world is dealing very gingerly with Syria. Unlike Libya and Muammar Gaddafi, who fell quickly in comparison, relatively speaking, Damascus hit by some of heaviest fighting since start of uprising. 25 rockets from Gaza, 150 in six days. The news, completely silent. Completely silent. Even Fox News. Thank you, Saudi Arabian prince who owns a major share in that network for muting the voice of the media here in the United States of America. Oh my goodness, if Israel were to respond in kind, oh, the whole international community will have an emergency meeting. That's Psalms 83, by the way. That's Psalms 83. U.S. concerned about Israeli strike on Damascus, and well, they should be. Ahmadinejad calls for new world order, <laughs> interesting, without nuclear monopoly. Israel says clock ticking after Iran talks fail. Did I just lose my microphone? I uh, yelled, that's what happened. I short-circuited it probably. <laughs> Am I back on? You want to use this? Or? Okay. My wife always says, stop yelling at people. I'm not yelling at them. I'm, okay, maybe I am, but anyway. <laughs> I want to share with you a couple of thoughts related to what the Lord has ministered to my heart concerning these prophecies. First, the common denominator in all of these breaking news stories is that they are exactly and precisely what the Bible predicted would happen. And by the way, all these headlines that I just read, they're from just the last two weeks, 14 days, if you will. And I'll have you know that I spent an enormous amount of time combing through all of these headlines over the last couple of weeks so as to condense them. Otherwise, we would have needed three hours to get through all of them and comment about them. You know, I realize that there's always the skeptic who will argue that it's always been like this. We've always had wars. We've always had rumors of wars. We've always had, you know, these kinds of things happening in the world. When they talk about earthquakes, we've always had earthquakes. Everybody's thought the, you know, the Lord was coming in their lifetime, and they're right. Even the Apostle Paul believed that it could be in his lifetime. It's called the doctrine of imminency. We won't get into it in the interest of time, but 
suffice it to say that that is by God's design that every generation live with that expectancy of the imminency of his return. However, to the skeptic, with all due respect, I would simply say, no way. Now let me explain. It has never been like this. I have been studying Bible prophecy for about 30 years and teaching Bible prophecy for about as many years and the events that we are now seeing are the likes of which mankind has never seen before. You could not read these headlines even 10 years ago. You could not read these headlines certainly 20 years ago and most definitely you could not read these headlines even 50 or 60 years ago because Israel didn't even exist as a nation yet. See on May 14, 1948 when by one vote in the UN Israel was reborn all of Bible prophecy began to accelerate the wheels were set in motion, and that's when I believe the clock started ticking. Now, here's why I say this, and here's where I'm going with this. If all of this happened just in the last two weeks, what do the next two weeks hold? Please keep in mind, we haven't even discussed how the U.S. is burning to the ground, literally. And nor have we discussed our plight as a nation economically. Let me give you some perspective and just ask you humbly to consider this. We could go to bed one night only to wake up the next day to a world that has changed overnight and will never be the same again prior to the rapture. Pastor, you're scaring me. Good? Maybe that's a good thing? Maybe that's a good fear to have? A healthy fear of the Lord? I would rather frighten somebody into heaven than flatter somebody into hell. Turn to Hebrews, the 10th chapter and the 25th verse. Hebrews 10, 25, a verse perhaps familiar to some, maybe most. It goes like this. Let us not give up meeting together. Some of your translations will render it. Do not forsake the assembling together. As some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you, watch this, see the day approaching. It's on this runway of Hebrews 10.25 that I'm going to bring today's prophecy update in for a landing. I want us to take a closer look at this astonishing verse, and it is astonishing. First, notice that the writer of Hebrews exhorts the reader to not give up assembling together as some were developing the habit of doing. Now the reason I point this out is because it seems to be the very thing that some are doing even now in the church today. They're growing weary. They're becoming leery of any discussion concerning the last days. You'd be hard-pressed to find a church, a pastor, a body of believers that are on fire for the Lord, excited about the return of the Lord. And whatever you do, don't bring up the topic of the rapture. Oh, you'd think you'd opened up a bottle of the Ebola virus. <gasps> oh no, that's not for us to know. It's not. That's not what my Bible says. My Bible says that we are to know and we are to be watching. So when it does happen, it will not catch us unaware. And that we are found faithful doing 
what our master has called and commanded us to do when he returns. There's an apathy, sadly, in the church today. And because of it, there is a forsaking of the fellowship in the church today. And it's so sad. It's so sad. The second thing I want to point out is that instead of the bad habit of not assembling together in the church, we're exhorted to develop a good habit of encouraging one another at the church. You know, this word assembling in the original language of the Greek New Testament is actually a better translation than gathering or meeting. It carries with it the idea of an assembling. This is a functional assembling together, best illustrated by this watch that I have on my wrist. Takes a licking and keeps on ticking. <laughs> See, all of the older people knew about that one. Okay, I just had to. I couldn't resist, couldn't help myself. This watch is functioning. I'm going to set it here on the pulpit on my Bible. Now, if all of the parts to this watch, the wristband, the dial, all the intricacies internally were all just gathered together, it wouldn't function. It wouldn't work. It wouldn't tell me what time it is. Conversely, all of the parts are not only gathered together, but they are assembled together. Do you see where I'm going with this? When we assemble together as a church body, we function. We minister one to another. We encourage one another. And I don't know about you, but I can always use a little bit of encouragement. Sometimes just a pat on the back. Or when a brother or sister says, hey, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for your family. Man, I, <laughs> thank you. I'm good for a month. Just one. I'm good for a month. We all need encouragement. And when we forsake the assembling of ourselves together in this church body, as a body of believers, we thwart that. Here's the third thing I want to draw to your attention. And notice that we're told why it is that we're to get in the habit of doing this. It's because we are seeing the day approaching. Seeing the day approaching. This brings us to the last thing that I want to draw your attention to. It's this key word concerning this day that's approaching. The key word is see. Notice it doesn't say as we believe the day is approaching. Big difference. Changes the whole complexion of the exhortation. In this case, seeing is believing, which begs the question of what is it that we're to be seeing? What is it that we're supposed to see that will cause us to believe that the day is approaching? Answer, all these things that we are now seeing. What are we now seeing? I'm so glad you asked. Syria falling, Israel prospering, Iran threatening, Russia posturing, America declining, Europe rising, and Islam dominating. And it's all happening in concert, one with the other, which makes it unique to our day and our time and our generation, and it distinguishes us from all generations prior. No generation has seen all of these things begin to come to pass as they have. Well, here's the takeaway for today. I'm going to pose it in a question. Could today be the day? 
It most certainly can be so, for the Bible tells me so. There is nothing that has to happen before the rapture happens. Psalms 83 doesn't have to happen. It's beginning to happen. It's on the cusp of happening, but it doesn't have to happen. Isaiah 17, the prophecy concerning Damascus doesn't have to happen. Isaiah 19, the prophecy concerning Egypt doesn't have to happen. Ezekiel 38 certainly doesn't have to happen. Nothing has to happen. The rapture can happen like that. At an hour, we expect not. Jesus said in John 14, 29, I have told you, this is a, a paraphrase, I have told you what's going to happen before it happens, so when it happens, you'll believe. If all that I've shared just makes you more excited, that's great. Praise God for that. But if you're not excited, then I implore you, nay, I beg you, you don't want to see a grown man cry on his 50th birthday, right? <laughs> it's my party, I can cry if I want. <laughs> I'm begging you. I'm begging you to call on the name of the Lord now. There is no more time. Romans 10, 13 says, For whoever, whoever, whosoever, you know who that includes? Everyone. All who call. You know how many all is? I'm not the sharpest knife in the kitchen drawer, but it's all. Look it up in the original. You know what all is in the original? All. All. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It is not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. If you're here this morning and you have even just a speck of doubt you need to do something about that today don't delay the risk the stakes are too high and too great because you don't know we're going to give you an opportunity before you leave here today to do some business with God if that's what you need to do here today Maybe for some of you as believers, you need to do some business with the Lord as well. Oh, you're saved. Praise God for that. You've been walking with the Lord for a number of years. Praise God for that. But I just wonder, have certain things taken up residence in your Christian life that don't belong there? They need to go. Are there certain things in your Christian life that it's not that you have them, they have you, and they're keeping you from loosening your grip on this world and the things of this world. You need to let go of them, put them away, and get ready. No, not get ready. It's too late to get ready. You need to be ready. There's no time to get ready. That's what I tell my kids every time before we come to church. You need to be ready. Oh, I'm getting ready. No, you, it, you need to be ready now because we're leaving now. <laughs> well, the same thing is true with the bride of Christ. There's no time to get ready. We need to be ready because we're leaving now. This world is not our home. We're just passing through. Would you pray with me? Loving Heavenly Father, we're stunned in a sanctified way. Lord, thank you for your word, the more sure word of prophecy. Thank you, Lord, for telling us what's going to happen before it happens, so when it happens, we'll believe. 
I pray for anyone here in this wonderful church this morning that maybe is not ready, that they today would be ready, that they would call upon you and be saved. Lord, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.